What is up everybody and welcome back to the horror franchise tier list series and now we are at part five, the horror five cool list. So if you've missed the last couple of videos, I started this about a month ago with 33 different horror franchises and we've been going through each individual installment of those movies. Now we are at chapter five and it's getting rough. <laughs> From here on out, there's not a whole lot of peaks. There's a whole bunch of valleys. So it's going to get interesting. Now, the categories of the tier are as follows from best to worst. We have horror classics, bloody good time, kills two hours, painful, and the dreaded slow death. Now, before we get into this tier list and talk about all of these varying degrees of quality movies, let's talk about the sponsor of this video, Atlas VPN. As a lot of you guys know, the more personal information that you put out into the internet, the more danger you are in for personal identity theft. But what you may not know is that one of the best ways to prevent the dangers of identity theft is through the use of a VPN service. Well, this month I've teamed up with Atlas VPN to bring you the most affordable deal on online protection at just $183 per month. And that includes a 30 day money back guarantee. On top of guarding your online identity, Atlas VPN also blocks malware and malicious links, keeps your Google searches private, even gives you access to online shopping deals and notifies you whenever someone is actually trying to steal your identity. And of course, it's the worst kept secret in the world that utilizing a VPN service can give you access to other regions content as far as streaming services. If Netflix has some content available only in the UK, if you use the VPN service to change your digital location, you can now access that while you're sitting in the US. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount to where you can actually get a three-year subscription for just $183 per month. And as stated, that does include the 30-day money-back guarantee. And you can access that deal right now before time runs out by clicking the link in the video description. So snag that deal and begin protecting yourself from online identity theft. And thank you, Atlas VPN, for sponsoring this video. All right, guys. Now, with all that being said, let's kick it off with Paranormal Activity, The Marked Ones. This was a first-time watch for me. And I will say this was a little bit of a step up from part four for certain. I'm going to put this one in kills two hours. Now this thing, I will give it credit that it has a lot more going on throughout the runtime than most of these paranormal activity movies. Typically all of them I tend to find is not really a whole lot going on. It's a lot of meandering until like the last 15 to 20 minutes. Then it goes balls out and then just cuts off immediately and you gotta watch the next movie. Now this one certainly does that as far as just cutting it off as soon as it gets crazy, but there is more interesting things going on throughout the second act. I think it was an interesting change of pace to place this in the Latino community and deal with kind of the different things that goes on within that community and the, the different lore as far as the grandma being into the witchcraft and everything. So the characters were fine, nothing to write home about, but nothing that was insulting. Overall, it was a watchable, paranormal activity movie. But thus far, five movies into this franchise, I have yet to see any of these films that I would actually want to watch again. Now we are at the Psycho remake, and this one is going to go under painful. Now I will say, the only reason that I'm putting it this low is just because I have a really serious gripe with shot for shot remakes. I don't think there's any point to it. I'm a big champion of a lot of remakes. Um, there's a lot of remakes out there that I actually prefer to the original film and have some serious uh, hot takes in regards to that. But I cannot stand when a modern filmmaker decides to just copy and paste the script and do it with a modern camera and a modern cast. I think it's ridiculous, I think it's a waste of time, and I don't understand the point of it. So as far as that goes, that's why it's in painful, because I will never watch this movie again. If I'm ever in the mood to watch it, I'm just gonna watch the original, it's the same fucking movie. With that being said, this movie's not anywhere near as bad as people make it out to be, just objectively. I think that aside from Vince Vaughn's serious miscasting of uh, Norman Bates, and aside from a couple of weird artistic shots of the sky and going a little bit too far as far as you know, like showing Anne Heche's asshole and things like that that just don't really add anything to that shower scene. Everything else about this I think is fine. I think there's a lot of really good casting actually. I actually think that Julianne Moore and William H. Macy are better casting in this movie than they were in the original film. I prefer this version of those characters. Uh, the story it's copy and paste Psycho so you can't say that Psycho is great without at least saying that this movie is great even if it's pointless, even if it's just uh, plagiarism, basically, it's still objectively the same script, the same story. So it's fine. I mean, I can watch it and be just fine. I'm not angered by this movie. I'm not uh, literally by the title pained by this movie, but 
I just think it's pointless and it irritates me that it exists. Now we have the Forever Purge. This was another first time watch for me. Never gave this one a chance and it's going underneath painful. This franchise just has no juice left in the tank, just none. I mean, this was a franchise that was just weird. It starts off with an interesting idea, doesn't really realize it in the first film. You get The Purge Anarchy, which I think is easily the best of this franchise, and Election Year, which is kind of diminishing returns, but similar to um, Anarchy. And then from there, they're just trying to milk this franchise. Let's do a prequel. Let's do, you know, let's retcon everything that happened and we'll just keep going with this concept. And so the Forever Purge is taking, much like the title suggests, the Purge, which is one night, 12 hours, and making it to where there's a group of people in the country that want to have it all year round, all day long. And it's a movie that just, it's diminishing returns. It's diminishing returns. The same exact thing that we've seen on the other movies, but not done nearly as well. The characters aren't nearly as interesting. By now, the concept is just bled dry. And the uh, social commentary, the political messaging in this movie is kind of pathetic because it's very direct. It's very in your face where they're going to be going with some kind of a message. And then they just never actually say anything. So it's just very weird. You've got America and there's a lot of commentary on immigration and the Mexican border by the end of the film because America has been taken over by these forever purge uh, people that the Americans are now trying to get over the border into Mexico for safe haven. So it's kind of like reversing the real world situation to try to hold a mirror up to us. But it's like, well, what are you saying about that then? You're just using that and you're not doing anything with it. So. I didn't enjoy this movie and it also was just way too long. Maybe I was just bored by it, but it felt like a half an hour. I'm like, fucking end. A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, Dream Child. This one for me, while not being anywhere nearly as bad as uh, Freddy's Dead, is still a slow death. I do not like this movie whatsoever. The one redeeming factor that I like in this film is the first kill, Dan's kill, the motorcycle kill. That's one of my favorite kills in the franchise. Everything else aside from that sucks. I think that um, th they try to do the same exact thing they did in part four where they don't have a script, they get a director, and they just let him kind of cobble this movie together as it goes along. And this guy, in my opinion, didn't do anywhere near as good of a job as Rennie Harlan with part four. And even part four has a laundry list of problems. So the whole extra jokey comedic tone is just continuing to rise by this point. It's no longer funny, it's no longer cute, it's no longer entertaining, it's just kind of embarrassing, and it gets even worse. Uh, we have the main character of Alice. I like her in part four and part five. She's okay, but again, she's just in a shit movie. She could have done a lot better with a better story, a better script. The whole concept of Freddy taking over the dreams of an infant is an interesting concept that they just don't execute very well. I hate the look of Freddy, the makeup in this. And beyond that first kill, all of the kills in this movie are just fucking silly. I mean, you've got the force-fed gluttony kill, which is just gross. You've got the comic book kill, which could have been interesting to look at, but it's just very campy and goofy. You've got these like swimming pool sequences that wasn't didn't end up being a kill, but almost was. I just don't enjoy this movie. I've given it just as many chances as every other Nightmare on Elm Street movie. And there's just very little in this one that entertains me. Sitting right next to Freddy 5 on the bus, we've got Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers. This movie can go fuck itself. This is my least favorite Halloween film. Most people say Resurrection or Halloween 2, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. This one to me is the worst. Not only is it just objectively a really bad movie and a really bad follow-up to part four, especially with how great the ending is to that, but subjectively, this film bores the living shit out of me. I, I cannot get through it without feeling like I need to fall asleep. You start to bring in the Cult of Thorn storyline here and the Man in Black, which is just weird Hail Mary ideas that never come together in a good way in this little uh, Thorn trilogy, as it was named afterwards. I think that they completely waste Danielle Harris here by making her a mute for most of the runtime with very little even sensible explanation to that, or sensical explanation, I should say. Even Dr. Loomis is not a likable guy in this film. He's got one good line about hell spitting him back out. And other than that, he's just really creepy. He's like, lose, he's lunacy at this point. He's losing his mind at the constant threat of Michael Myers and the constant pursuit of him. Uh, I think that the way that they kill Rachel 
is absolutely unforgivable just to replace her with Tina, one of the most insufferable fucking characters in horror movie history. I could go on and on. I hate this movie. I despise it. It's my least favorite Halloween film, and it's absolutely a slow-ass death. Now we have Dominion, and this one is painful for me. Now, I'm not really a big fan of Exorcist the beginning, but I do prefer that to Dominion. For those that don't know, Dominion was originally the Exorcist prequel that was shot, and the movie was almost complete, and then the studio said, nope, this isn't working, go back to the drawing board. They got a new director in Rennie Harlan and reshot the entire fucking movie and released the reshoot version, which was Exorcist the beginning, first. Eventually, they released this one, uh, maybe a limited theatrical release, but mostly everybody saw it on DVD or VOD, and it's a very different movie. It's still the same basic plot, it's still the same main character and the cast, uh, casting of the main character, Everything else is totally different. This is more of a drama. This is more of an exploration of faith and exploration of the character of Father Marin, which on paper should make this better since the other one is just a very surface level horror movie. But it doesn't feel like an exorcist movie to me. It doesn't feel like it really belongs in this franchise and it's pretty boring. And it leads up to a third act that I think is very silly. I mean, you got this guy that gets possessed and then he's just like floating in a cave with a bald head and just... It's very silly to me, and so if I'm going to pick one, even though none of them are very good, I'm going to pick the one that's at least more of a horror film, has some thrills, has some kills, and has Pazuzu in the third act. This one, to me, just bored me, and I'll never have any interest in watching it again. Now we have the newest addition to the Scream franchise in Scream 5, and I had a really good time with this one. I'm sticking it in bloody good time. Said it before, very casual Scream fan, but I think that all of these movies are actually pretty good, even the third one. So Scream 5, I had a lot of faith in it. Uh, it's been a long time since we have seen Scream, and the big question mark everybody had is, are you going to be able to do a Scream film without Wes Craven? And in my opinion, yes, they succeeded with it. They succeeded a lot with it. Uh, I think that this is a really good continuation of the franchise's story. I like the way that they utilize the legacy characters for the most part. I think Dewey by far has the best uh, treatment in this movie, though some would agree. Some don't like the way that his character turns out. I disagree with that. Uh, I like most of the new cast here, especially the ones that they're setting up to be recurring characters that we are inevitably going to see in next year's Scream 6. Uh, the reveals of the killers I thought were really obvious. That was the biggest issue that I had with the film. I figured it out like within the first act. Uh, and I wasn't really searching for it. It wasn't like I was sitting there trying to analyze everything. It was just one thing happened and I'm like, that's something that would really lead to a killer's motivation there. And it just, it worked out and I was kind of disappointed by that. Uh, the kills... I still wish they would get a little more creative, but at least they were a little more vicious, a little more mean in this film. Uh, and overall, I enjoyed it as a casual Scream fan. It's not the best, it's far from the worst, it's just a really good time for me if I'm in the mood for a Scream film. Oh God, rip my fucking heart out. Phantasm Ravager, I despise this movie. Look, I am one of those people that live and die by the first Phantasm and the second Phantasm movies. I grew up with them, they are among my favorite movies of all time, and I have had casual fun with three and four, although they're nowhere near as good as one and two. But I waited for well over a decade for them to finally close out the franchise, to pay off on that cliffhanger that they left us all on with Phantasm Four, and there was just news about a movie, and then there was rumors and news and rumors and news and rumors for years. Then finally, they're like, we're doing it. It's shooting. There's a new director. It's not Don Coscarelli. We're finally going to end this franchise. And I was so excited that the movie was actually going to happen because it felt like we were just never going to get the conclusion. And then this piece of shit drops, and this is just an abomination for this franchise. I think that every single thing that they try to do, they fall on their face. I think that most of the casting here just acts like they don't even care anymore, which I guess I kind of get because they were getting dicked around for well over a decade, but... None of them are very good. Even Reggie, who's always good in these movies, was not very good in this. You can tell that the director was not Don Coscarelli. There is some really bad CGI. Like, there's a shot of a gigantic orb that just looks horrendous. Like, bad sci-fi channel movie level bad. Uh, I think that the way that they decide to follow this up and close out the story by not really answering anything and suggesting a lot of possible explanations while not committing to any of them 
I think it's a real disservice to the franchise because all of the things that they bring up in this movie out of nowhere regarding Reggie's dementia and is it all in his head, is it all made up, I think that that absolutely kills the franchise if you're trying to suggest that maybe that's actually what's been going on for five fucking movies. So I could go on and on. I've watched this movie twice and the second time I hated it even more. I really am going to choose never to watch it again if I can get away with it. Uh, as a Phantasm fan, we deserve much better. Texas Chainsaw Massacre Remake. Oh my god, we actually have a horror classic on this fucking list. Look, remember what I said earlier about remakes? This is one of my favorite ones. I absolutely adore this movie. I think that it is the best Texas Chainsaw movie. Uh, I think it's a very dark and grim and uh, morbid but yet very entertaining and slick version of this story. I understand those that grew up with the original that hold that in a very dear to their hearts. I'm not one of those people. So I watched this one. I love this. This is my preferred version of the film, uh, of the storyline of these characters. I think that Leatherface is at his scariest in this movie. His mask is better in the next film that we're going to talk about, but I think he's at his best as far as the fright factor in this. Uh, I think that Arlie Ermey's uh, sheriff here is arguably the scariest character of the entire franchise, even over Leatherface, and that's a tall order. I love all of the characters for the most part, all of like the victim characters. Jessica Biel gets a little aggravating in the movie just because she keeps doing the stupid horror character thing and just won't keep going, but... It's one of those things with horror movies. You know, if they did the smart thing, the movie would be five minutes long. So it's about finding a balance between them doing stupid shit to keep the plot going while not completely losing your audience and going, this makes no fucking sense. So I think they do a decent enough balance here. Uh, the gore is not like overly gratuitous, but it's still very effective and very disturbing. Uh, it's shot very well. There's some great cinematography, some great lighting. Uh, there's not a whole lot negative, I have to say, about this movie, honestly. I've never understood those that hate it. To me, it's still the scariest theater experience that I ever had, and I still really love this movie and will always have a nice place in my heart reserved for it because of all of that. Now we are at Critter's Attack, and I'll be honest with you, I don't remember hardly jack shit about this movie, so I'm going to stick it in painful because I don't remember absolutely despising it like I did three. Uh, to me, it was like right there with four, where I'm like, there's a couple of scenes here and there that's okay, but I don't need to watch this again. Uh, I think that the gore was cranked up in this one quite a bit, and I think that they were trying to rejuvenate the franchise for like the sci-fi channel or something, and so when you walk in with those expectations, it's tolerable, but I'm just not a big fan of this franchise. So it's not the franchise at its worst in my opinion, but it's certainly not a movie that gives me hope for the future of the Krites. Now we have Hellraiser Inferno, which is also going to go into Painful. This was one of, if not my least favorite, Hellraiser film, and for as bad as that franchise is overall, I don't remember any of the Hellraiser movies just really just irking the living shit out of me to where I was just angry that I watched it. Uh, this was one of my least favorite, or possibly my least favorite, because it's just the least memorable to me. There's like a whole chunk of like four movies right in the middle of that franchise to where it was the spec script that just sat around that was like this detective noir generic straight to DVD story. Somebody picked it up at the studio and penciled in Pinhead into a few pages and released it as a Hellraiser film. Now, you've got Scott Derrickson directing here, so you have a very good director, somebody who became an even better director. There's some cool, creepy imagery here. There's some interesting visuals going on in this movie that I have to give credit for. And I always love seeing James Remar, even though it's a little silly, his placement in the movie, it still warms my heart to see him. So those things made it tolerable. The main character is a despicable person, despicable character, and when you're forced to sit through a movie that's very unpleasant with a character that is very unpleasant in a world that's very unpleasant, it becomes an unpleasant experience. Friday the 13th, A New Beginning, The Roy Chronicles. This one's a kill two hours for me. I have never hated this movie. It's never been one of my favorites, but I've never found it to be as terrible as people make it out to be. It's oftentimes hated because it's not technically Jason Voorhees in this movie, and so it gets that Halloween 3 effect, where because Michael Myers isn't in it, it's automatically garbage. Well, stylistically, visually, it might as well be Jason Voorhees. It's a Friday the 13th film through and through. It's got the most kills, it's got the most nudity, so there's that. Um, but it's a, it's a movie where there's a copycat killer when they thought they were done with Jason Voorhees, and after this they said, nope, bring that motherfucker back. 
Uh, but I do have fun with this one. It's extremely campy. It's extremely goofy and extremely silly. So you either have to vibe with that or not. If it's not your thing, you're going to hate it. If you can have fun with this really overly cheesy 80s tone and bad 80s writing, it's actually a pretty decent time. Now we are at Prometheus, and this one is also a kills two hours for me. I've never really liked this movie all that much. The only reason that it's at kills two hours is because I think that it is masterfully directed by Ridley Scott. It looks gorgeous. There is some amazing set design, some amazing effects, some amazing shots and cinematography, very good acting, especially by Michael Fassbender. And his character is honestly the only reason why I do somewhat value these two movies in this little prequel trilogy that we get here, because it's a very interesting character that's written and acted very well. But this was marketed and this was hyped up as a prequel to Alien. And that seems like the secondary priority of this movie. It's much more of an exploration of creation and life and life's relationship with its creator and vice versa. And a lot of these big ideas that Ridley Scott is trying to philosophically explore in this film. And it just happens to put a couple of building blocks in place that will eventually lead to the original Alien. And as somebody that loves the Alien franchise, that's the stuff that I came for. So there's a lot of people that loved what this movie was, and they actually loved the fact that it wasn't what one of us simpletons would write as an Alien prequel. It was something very different and unexpected. But I'm somebody that I just, I want what was promised to me. And uh, we'll talk about it in the next one, but even Alien Covenant kind of pulled the same bait and switch for me. So Prometheus, while I understand why some absolutely love it and adore it for what it is, for me, it's always a very awkward watch that... I'm never really all that entertained by. Oh, seed of Chucky. Oh, you poor, poor little bitch. Uh, slow death. Absolutely slow death. Look, I've given this movie so many chances. Uh, I really have. I've watched it uh, probably more times than I've given chances to Freddy's Dead and uh, uh, Dream Child here. I just don't understand what they were going for with this movie. I don't enjoy it. I, I know that they were just trying to just let it loose and have fun and be ultra goofy and campy just for the hell of it. It doesn't work for me. Uh, I think it's easily the worst in the Child's Play franchise, and uh, it's right there with Freddy's Dead for like one of my most hated movies of all time. As a die-hard Chucky fan, as a die-hard fan of the Child's Play franchise, this is the bottom point of this franchise for me in so many ways. It's ultra meta to where Chucky and Tiffany are now being made into a movie, and you've got Jennifer Tilly, who does the voice of Tiffany and was playing Tiffany in the previous movie, is also now playing herself as the actress Jennifer Tilly, and Tiffany, who is played by Jennifer Tilly, has an infatuation with the actress Jennifer Tilly, and just that alone is like, what the fuck are you guys doing? But it just keeps going from there. You've got the child, the seed of Chucky here, which is Glenn, and eventually is also Glenda, uh, which over time, I understand that, especially with Don Mancini and the things that he's been trying to put forefront in this franchise since he's gotten creative control over it, that this character was kind of a love letter or a um, representation, a showcase for gender fluid people, gender fluid children. Totally respect that, totally understand that, but as a character in the movie, I just don't like the execution of that character, the comedy with him pissing his pants the entire movie a running joke that wasn't funny the first time and they do it like four more times. Uh, there's a lot of attempts at humor in here that falls completely flat. The gore is cranked way up, but it just doesn't work for me. Uh, there, there's a very, very specific audience member that this movie really works for. I know some people that love it. I know one person that this is their favorite in the franchise, but for me, what I come to this franchise for, what I come to Chucky for, this is anything but that. Resident Evil Retribution, this one is painful. This is the first movie in the franchise that I just flat out did not like. And uh, I'm very forgiving on this franchise, that tells you a lot. This is the point where they just did not give a fuck about story, did not give a fuck about continuity, certainly didn't give a fuck about respecting characters of the video games. And so you have these things where these like little underwater or these underground domes are being like biomes for different environments that were already taking place in the movies previous, like The Hive and like Raccoon City. And so you have Alice going through, you got Leon Kennedy that's put into this movie. 
and it's just a stepping stone film. It takes the ending of the last film with all those helicarriers, which they do an Alien 3 and wipe out everybody that survived to the end of the last film in the opening credits. And then Alice is doing her thing again, and then it stops again with this ending where now all of the heroes and villains of this franchise are going to team up because the whole world's been ravaged by monsters. And then in the next film, they completely get rid of that plot line too. So the last two movies in this franchise are fucking rough. The next one's worse. The next one's not going to be any better. But Retribution, uh, I gave it a second chance last year. Didn't age any better. Now we are at the Omen remake and pretty much say everything I said about the uh, Psycho remake here. I don't like the fact that this is a pretty much shot for shot remake. It's script for script. There's certainly some new shots. There's certainly some new sequences here and there with the way that they shoot them, the way that they do them. There's a couple of different twists on the kills in this movie, but it's the same fucking movie. And so it's even more frustrating than Psycho for me because The Omen, you could do something really interesting with a modern take on it. And they cast it really well. You've got Liev Schreiber here. I thought he was great. I really like Julia Stiles. Uh, I even like the, the casting of the, the, the photographer that's helping, the reporter that's helping him by the end. I can't remember the guy's name, but I always like seeing him. But it's a movie that despite having carte blanche to do what they want, they decide to just do shit that was already proven. And so... Uh, I think that the Psycho, if I'm going to be on paper and talk about these two shot-for-shot -shot remakes, I think Psycho is better done. Uh, so I would actually prefer to watch that over The Omen, but they kind of fall into the same category for me as why the fuck do you exist? Just, just leave. Just stop. Now we are at Final Destination 5, and this one I'm not as high on as everybody else. This one's a kills two hours for me. This seems to be a fan favorite, and I've never understood why. I've seen this movie twice, I rewatched it recently, and I don't know. Something about it, like, I, I like the fact that they introduced, like, this uh, twist near the end where that one of the characters becomes, like, a killer, and so you have, like, this... Uh, this extra threat that's brought into the third act that's interesting. Uh, I like the final twist of the movie that I won't spoil, but those that have seen it knows. Uh, the way that this movie fits into the timeline of the franchise was interesting and unexpected, so I like that. Other than that, though, I think the characters are very generic, and I think the kills are overly CGI'd, which is a problem that I have with the fourth film. It's not as egregious as four, but I like the kills when they look real. I felt like they looked pretty real in the first two movies, and then after three, it's just a lot of CGI blood. It's a lot of very computer-generated gore that just is not convincing for me. So I can have fun with this one. It's a good movie as far as the franchise goes. But for being a movie that I've seen a lot of people say is their favorite, the best of this franchise, I've just never seen that version of this. Wrong Turn 5 Bloodline, I believe, is the subtitle. Uh, this movie can go to hell. I hated this movie. Look, Wrong Turn is a rough franchise, but it never gets as bad as Wrong Turn 5. Wrong Turn 5 is just a despicable movie to me. Not only is the quality just sub-zero, like it, it's not even at the fucking floor, it digs a little bit deeper as far as the gore, the makeup effects, the look of the cannibals. Uh, you've got sets to where they're clearly just going around a city block and shooting it like it's a whole city. It's so fucking cheap looking. You've got the introduction of Doug Bradley in here as like, the, the lucid member of this family who's like controlling the cannibals. And it should have been really cool to see him, but they don't do anything interesting with him. It is so gross. It is so mean spirited. And like, it's weird to when you cross that line in a slasher because ultimately we're watching these movies to watch people get murdered. But when it goes to a point where it's not entertaining, it's just like sickening. I mean, you've got a lot of women that are put into really bad situations in this movie that is not fun to watch them in. And the movie leaves off on a note where it basically directly suggests that the survivor of the movie that has lost her eyeballs is now going to be sexually assaulted for the rest of her short and extremely miserable life. And it just, it's so sickening to watch this movie. Like I have certain lines that I can't cross when I watch these films. Otherwise I'm just losing the enjoyment factor and it's no longer entertainment in any way, shape or form for me. And this movie crosses those lines like numerous times. I hated it. Now we are at Saw 5 and we're going to painful for this one. This movie just bores me, honestly. It's not like a really, really bad Saw movie. Uh, I don't even remember if I gave a fuck this movie to any of these films, but Saw 5 to me is where you have good detective versus bad detective 
and it's just not very interesting. There's this subplot going on that gives us all of our kills because we do have to have traps in this movie, but the ultimate plot that it's going through, which is one guy versus another guy, this battle of wills, is not very interesting, and I don't care about either of the characters or either one of them winning. I don't like the villain. I don't think he's a good replacement for any of the villains that we had in the first four films, and the Luke from Gilmore Girls, not a very compelling protagonist either. And so this movie is just that drab middle of the franchise chapter to where I just get little to no enjoyment out of it. Leprechaun in the hood. Okay, this one, it kills two hours. Like it, it's, uh, it borders on painful, but it is kind of a goofy concept that has some fun. Like I like iced tea in here. I like having uh, some of the very self-aware humor here with the leprechaun actually being in the hood. So there is some laughs to be had. There's some moments that are funny when the leprechaun starts rapping about weed and things like that. Uh, but it's very low hanging fruit. If you're not a fan of this franchise, this is not going to change your mind whatsoever. And depending on my mood, it might be a painful experience sometime. But uh, I remember it being decent enough to where I feel comfortable putting it in kills two hours. Now we are at the new dog, Prey. And this is the reason why I waited a little bit to do this list. This is absolutely a bloody good time. It's very close to going up the horror classic, I'll tell you. Like, I need to give it a little bit more time. Maybe eventually it'll get there. Uh, I really enjoyed this movie. To me, it's the best Predator film since the first one. Still not uh, a complete knockout. Uh, as far as my negatives, I didn't think that the side characters were written very well. I didn't think that having the Comanche characters speak somewhat modern English uh, played very well. It just felt odd that they were talking like not that differently than how we talk today. Uh, but once you kind of get past that uncanny valley, I think that this movie has a lot of merit to it. I love the fact that uh, you get a very classic storyline with the main character about a girl trying to prove herself as a warrior. And so the predator in this movie, as the title suggests, kind of becomes her prey. And you get a predator that is scaled back in technology. So it's more about stabbing weapons and hand-to-hand -hand combat and arrows. So it kind of matches the dynamic of the fighters that are going to be going against the Predator. A lot of very visceral action scenes as a result of that because it is more hand-to-hand -hand and not like plasma casters and, and long-range combat. I think that there is some pretty, uh, not necessarily as gratuitous and as exciting as some of the other movies in this franchise, but there's some pretty good gore in this movie that I was surprised by. For some reason, I thought this was PG-13, but uh, it's not. It pushes it pretty fair into rated R with some of the kills here, decapitations and blood and explosions and stuff. Uh, and by the end of it, I just think it's a really good story. It does a bit of a throwback to the classic setup of the original film without retreading the original film too much. So I really enjoyed this one. Highly recommend checking it out. It's on Hulu this weekend. So uh, this past weekend, by the time you watch it, uh, yes, Absolutely recommend it. It's a bloody good time. Oh, now we are at Underworld, whatever the fuck, Blood Wars, who cares? It's a painful experience. This is another movie in this franchise that's just like, okay, now you're the movie that everybody said that you were in the first two. I still love the first two. I think the first two are great, and I have a lot of fun with the third one, but the fourth one was a gigantic step downward. This one's even more of a step downward. It's another stepping stone movie to where they don't even really completely pay off the unresolved storylines of the last movie or even the second film. And they're just keeping going for the sake of having Kate Beckinsale do badass shit. And so when you watch this, it's just like, okay, guys, you're just, you're played out at this point. If you're not going to do anything interesting, if you're not going to go back to the interesting exploration of lore and doing things a little bit more mythic and gothic like the first couple of movies, and if you're not going to have action sequences that were on the level of the first two movies, then why the fuck are we here? And so it's no question whatsoever why this, which came out the same year as the final uh, Resident Evil movie, that this kind of killed the franchise and we haven't even heard a whisper of them ever trying to revisit the Underworld franchise because this was this is just not it. Well, that's it for this one, guys. Please do not miss out on that huge discount with Atlas VPN. Check the link in the video description and get your three-year subscription. Be sure to click over here and check out the playlist for the rest of these horror franchise tier lists. And I'm also going to put my Friday the 13th franchise list up here as well. Please like and share this video and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss anything in the future. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.